You're listening to The Vint Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, joined once again in our studio setup with Billy Galenko. How are you doing, Billy? Good, good. We survived a tropical storm, just kicking it off with weather as usual. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. That's kind of, uh, I bet that was a little bit scary for you and your, uh, do, do you have an indoor seating area or is everything out, outdoors in LA at your house? Uh, um, yeah, no, we, we have room inside, but um, <laughs> it's not just are... tents. <laughs> No, or patios. No, people. It was funny though. People were battening down the hatches like it was going to be some some intense intense thing. It was just kind of rainy. Um, they canceled school the next day, which is funny because it was bright and sunny and like literally not a cloud in the sky after like noon. Um, so that was pretty funny. But I guess out in Palm Springs, they actually got you know a year's worth of rain, which is like six inches. So that's kind of intense. Wow. Yeah, we used to get school canceled for uh, high winds and uh, rain sometimes. So I think we we had school canceled for less back then. I think it's because we have a lot of uh, like windy country roads where I grew up, and they were always afraid that the bus would just blow over if the wind was too bad. <laughs> so there were a few <laughs> times where we had big storms coming. The wind was like just not even that bad, 40 mile an hour, and they would cancel school. <laughs> wow. Well, here they canceled but, for less. So That's right. Yeah, we have, uh, apart from these in thrilling updates, we have some new things coming to the Vint podcast. Uh, do you want to tell folks about some of the tasting note stuff that we're going to start doing? Yeah, yeah. So we've been thinking for a while now that we, we talk about a lot of these wines and whiskeys that we've had, but there's no way for anybody to really kind of either dive in and learn more about them or really go back and kind of try to remember them maybe after listening to the podcast. So we're going to roll out a a blog that basically tracks and logs the whiskeys and wines that we discuss on the podcast. We'll have quick tasting notes there. Um, nothing really formal, but it'll be our general general thoughts um, on the whiskeys and the wines. And we'll basically list them so that you can, you know, double check and maybe go and explore them more on your own um, after the podcast. So I think that is one thing we're going to be adding. And then another aspect similar but different will be a um, what we're drinking this weekend. It'll be kind of a weekly wine highlight. And for those who are on the Vint mailing list, you will know this is included in our Friday email each week. But now for Vint podcast listeners, what we're going to do is give you an early kind of early access to the what we're drinking section. And I'll obviously be giving a little bit more more color to that as well. Um, so it'll be kind of an enhancement of, of what you might be seeing if you're already on the Vint mailing list on Fridays. Yeah, we'll definitely try and work more whiskey, um, scotch, bourbon. Uh, maybe some other spirits into those notes and emails as well. Um, trying to have more whiskey folks on the podcast over the next, you know, course of episodes. Um, we've definitely been predominantly wine focused. So it was cool to have Scott last week, who I think was our first whiskey producer. So, yeah, producer. I think so. Aside from Andre Houston Mack, who makes his own rye now. Don't forget that. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. But, purely whiskey yeah it was the first one nice yeah so if any listeners have um you know if you take a look at the tasting notes as we go and you have uh, either comments about them or maybe are looking to acquire some of those wines or whiskeys we can also help you with that on a one-off basis you can uh, email us at the emails found in the description of the podcast and if we can get a hold of something for you we can definitely help to direct you to that i know billy drinks a lot of obscure things so it might be a little bit of a hunt yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, we'll definitely be talking about a lot, of, a lot of random things. It may not be the most accessible, um, not for price sake, but literally just because they're made in somebody's cavevery in their garage. But you know, who knows? We'll we'll cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll put my neighbor's uh, Concord grape. Um, yeah, stuff that he made at home in his bathtub. Oh yeah, yeah, my my Zinfandel. I still I gotta find those six bottles. It'll be the five year anniversary of me making that. Um, but on a different note, so this was partially inspired by tastings that we've done. And on that note, I went to a tasting last week um, where I had a bunch of Sancerre and Pue Fume 
um, Puyi Fume. God, I can always say that word wrong. Um, so, uh, Sauvignon Blancs from France, Brady. I don't think I've told you about this yet. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's one of the regional uh, names that I always shy away from. I just point to it and say this one because I'm like, Puyi Fume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't really know until studying wine. Like, when I started studying wine, you first hear about Sancerre, and you know that is, you know, the most well-known, I guess, um, Sauvignon Blanc in France. I mean, some will argue that Bordeaux Blanc, but um, right next door is Pori Fume, and most wine connoisseurs know they're, they're both as, um, as well-known. And I was talking to the guy at the tasting last week, and he, he, somebody was actually asking him why Sancerre is better known. Is it better quality? And he's like, no, it's not better. It's just easier to say. So that's the reason it became way more famous. That's funny. Um, <laughs> so you know what's even there. easier to say? <laughs> it's New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want something that tastes completely different, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had, let's see, let me count them six, six different wines. Um, and the, the highlight, I guess, was a Domain Didier uh, Dagenau, which is one of the most famous Puy Fume producers um, around. Um, so basically, we, we've sold a lot of his wine on the marketplace. So I've been looking at it in some of them. The, the pure sang, P-U-R-S-A-N-G of his uh, goes for a lot of money. So I, I had like a $100 bottling called Blanc, et cetera. Um, but I have tasting notes for the six wines. There were two from, uh, let's see, three from Sancerre and two from Puy Fume, and then one from an area called Coteau de Genois Blanc. Um, Coteau de Genois is like just northeast of Puy Fume, which I thought was interesting. It's basically... These two regions are becoming so popular that they're now having the, the outer regions producing similar quality wines, but at an, a like a more approachable price point. Um, so that was really interesting. Trying to walk through that little region because the wines vary very differently. Um, some were you know more herbaceous, some were kind of almost like round because they had some time in barrel, but not new barrel. Um, so I'll include all my tasting notes for these six wines um, in the blog that'll be published over the next week, uh, if anybody wants to check them out. But yeah, there were wines from, let's see, Christophe Monger and Coteau de Genois, uh, Domaine Torbordé, um, Domaine Dominique and Janine Crochet. Uh, Vincent Pinard was another big name and Henri Bourgeois along with the Dagenau. Um, so we got some some really cool ones and a little bit of age on them too. And that was, that was pretty exciting. Um, so I'm happy to share those with everyone. Yeah, that's always an interesting exploration. I think I've only had older Sauvignon Blanc once. Do you remember when we were at a Barbersville in Virginia? I believe there was like a seven-year-old Sauvignon Blanc that was like the current release. Um, I think that was the only one of the only times I've had Sauvignon Blanc that wasn't like less than three years old. <laughs> yeah, it might have been William Kelly who was complaining about it, but back in the day, Bordeaux Blanc, which is the still the the dry ones or predominantly Sauvignon Blanc with some Semillon and some other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. They were, they were meant to age and some of those aged beautifully. And then they tried to start replicating more of the New Zealand style and got away from kind of what they were, their bread and butter and they don't age quite like they used to, but those also can age. Um, one fun, one interesting thing I learned about Dagenau, I always knew he was famous. Apparently the founder Didier himself is now run by his son and daughter and his sons are becoming famous as the winemaker. Um, apparently he died in like, an ultralight accident, like, you know, one of those, like basically oh, wow. a, a hang glider with a motor. Um, yep. the guy was like, yeah, a small like airplane accident. Cause he was, they were like, this area is known and it had these, these mountains really give the wine a certain, you know, texture and the different, like the Silex soils and limestone. They're like, but it also was his downfall. He crashed into the mountain or like, you know, in the thing. And I was just <laughs> like, all right, wow. That's a, uh, that's kind of weird. But, um, so now I can't think about it in the same way. It's an interesting, the most famous wine and a death defying story, like an evil can evil twist to it. So, I mean, didn't defy death, but, um, a death story. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> death defining. <laughs> <laughs> defining. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, is it, you know, if you, if you say name a wine aged in Oak, probably Sauvignon Blanc, just off the top of the, you know, top 20 great varietals would be the last one that I would say. Um, does, Oak influence affect potential ageability of wine? Like, does it impart some like tannic structure or like body to the wine that helps it to age a little bit more? 
I was going to say, don't don't tell that to Robert Mandavi. He brought the the barrel aged Sauvignon Blanc to the the U.S. Um, no, it it can. Um, there there's two schools of thought here. One is like what you were saying. A lot of this is like more neutral barrel, so it's not imparting as much direct flavor from the the barrel itself. And in, in that same vein, not as much tannin. Um, it can a little bit. Um, some of it's more of the interaction with oxygen over time that helps round out certain parts um, of the wine. So it might round off some of like certain fruity components, but it also the interaction with oxygen might allow other, I guess you'll lose kind of the fruity esters, but it kind of rounds it out and allows the wine itself to age better in bottle. Cause there are some elements that basically don't do well when they're interacting with oxygen, if they're made in a completely like oxygen free environment throughout their their whole environment like the whole time oh, so basically, yeah yeah so it's like between the lees stirring which also gives it more body and some of this oxygen interaction these wines are actually better set up to age longer in the bottle and develop in a different way because they're not relying exclusively on primary fruit and like basically floral notes because if that's what you're all you're preserving as soon as oxygen hits that you're just going to be left with acid like uh what, what was his name the guy the master of wine who came on that's what i was going to uh, say yeah uh, acid the acid without a uh, or Sauvignon Blanc without acid is pointless. Yeah. Nick Jackson, MW. Yeah. That's so, right. so you need the acid, but this basically would be like, that would just be acid and no floral notes here. They get, it got more development. Like there is, you could definitely got like a, almost a yeasty nature. Some of these had like nutty notes, um, almost like a honeyed um, aspect to them, which was, was really interesting. And you don't typically think of for Sauvignon Blanc, unless you're looking at more of these higher quality barrel, um, and the, you're, it's large barrel too, like, you know, fooders, like, you know, the really big ones, you're not just barriques. Um, so it all imparts stuff, but it can set it up for better long-term aging actually. Yeah. Not that I drink too much Bordeaux Blanc, I wouldn't say, but if you had asked me before you're talking about this, if you had asked me the, I, I would have assumed that it was like 90% Semillon, most of the wines and basically no Semillon Blanc, even though I knew that you know, that was included. Um, is that not the case? Is it mainly like, could it be one or the other in a lot of these wines or is it pretty balanced or is it usually pretty much all Semillon and then like the acid from the Sauvignon Blanc? It's changing um, in modern times, but traditionally and still very much in most cases, the still wines are mostly Sauvignon Blanc with some Semillon and very um. little if any Muscadel. Whereas like the Sauterne and like the Batritized wines are mostly Semillon with a little bit of Semillon. Oh, uh, okay. And then some Muscadel. So yeah, you have it. That's definitely, action. yeah, the Batritis, like, yeah, the, the sweeter stuff is definitely, I guess, what I more would have in mind when thinking about those wines. And so I guess, yeah, the Semillon, that's where I got that from probably. Mm -hmm. And that's where the acid from the Semillon sense. Blanc helps brighten those up. Oh, uh, understood. Yeah, because nice. it kind of gets worked through a little bit by the botrytis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, cool. Yeah, I don't know if our uh, if our guest today deal. I guess he de definitely deals in uh, some Bordeaux Blanc. I didn't look through on um, on the site, but I would imagine so. It definitely has a few producers that he works with in Bordeaux. We're um, we're talking about Kevin Sitters, the founder and uh, president of Ving Connect. Uh, out of Virginia, who we have on today. Um, Kevin's actually a friend, has been a friend of Vint for some time, even before really um, our initial launch, um, and did some advising with Nick, our founder, in the early days, and has, has been a good partner and friend. And um, so it's great to have him on and talk about his business and trying to provide more access to producers across the pond, uh, mainly in France, focusing on Burgundy and Bordeaux, but he has relationships with producers in a number of different countries and is providing more access to consumers here in the States. Yeah. Kevin was actually one of the first people I talked about when I considered joining Vint and being a part of the company. I actually called him and Adam, who's now our, uh, our CEO, head of wine. Um, so that was, it was cool. We have known Kevin for a long time. He, he brings an interesting perspective. <clears throat> he kind of got into wine after investment banking and he'll talk about that, but it has more of like a passion as well as like a business opportunity. So it's great to hear him kind of talk about what he's doing because he's, it was more 
something he's always been interested in rather than just purely a business opportunity. You can really hear the passion come through and the interest when he's, when he's talking about the producers he works with and his wines. Yeah. And I got some good recommendations after talking with Kevin. Um, I think one other time when we had talked with him, we had talked about Chateau Moussard, uh, but we talk about it again for a decent amount of time on this interview and went and purchased some bottles after that. So um, yeah, definitely uh, cool to hear about some of the different producers that he's involved with. And uh, really what he's doing is facilitating a way for producers to be in contact, kind of like a uh, newsletter style sort of allocation list with the producers that um, yeah, don't usually have programs set up the way that we do here in the States where you kind of get on an allocation list on a newsletter distribution list with producers here. Um, so he's trying to facilitate that kind of back and forth relationship. And um, yeah, I signed up for a couple uh, different lists and he uh, t- certainly knows a lot about the producers that he works with. So it's cool to hear him talk about some of those. For sure. A hundred percent. I encourage everybody to, to check those out. Anybody who's supporting small producers or producers making wine the right way in Europe is always a fan in my book. Um, or I'm always a fan of them. So definitely check out VinConnect and enjoy our interview with Kevin Sitters. Hey, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're a, a long-term or long-term, long-time uh, Vint Pod listener and just a friend of Vint in general, right? Yes, I've uh, known you guys for a long time, and I'm, I'm uh, pleased to finally have a chance to, to sit down and uh, talk in the podcast context, so it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's exciting to have um, someone who's kind of, uh, you know, a part of the Virginia wine scene as well, um, you know, uh, as a merchant sort of in the area. And um, I want you to tell a little bit about VinConnect and just maybe some of your early journey into wine. You don't need to go back 75 years, but um, <laughs> as, as far as you want to share. Yeah. Sure. Um, So VinConnect, the business I started, has been around for about 12 years. And what we do is help consumers um, get access to wines from a bunch of the top wineries in Europe. Flipped around, we we help Europe's best wineries sell direct to consumers in the U.S. in many of the same ways that U.S. wineries do. Historically, that hasn't really been a thing. It's it's not legal for European wineries to sell direct in the U.S. Uh, in the same way that domestic wineries do. Um, but that really puts them at a strategic and competitive disadvantage. And so uh, we created VinConnect to find a way to help them do that so that customers can be on the mailing lists of Europe's best wineries in the same way they are with America's best wineries, you know, Silver Oak, Camus, Chateau Montalena, Harlan, people like that. Now you can do that same thing for Clos de Tarte in Burgundy or Domaine de Pego and Chateau de Tepa or Laurence Ponceau in Burgundy, Masolino in Barolo, things like that. Yeah. So when you, when you go to Europe and you visit a producer, um, you know, they'll bring around and ask if you want to purchase and they'll show you all the shipping options and everything. They'll help you facilitate that. Um, is the only difference between what you're able to do in terms of sending wine back to the States and doing that, you know, I guess online through some kind of allocation methodology. The only difference between those two, is it just that the transaction is happening on their soil versus over the internet or why is there such, why is there a difference? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, sort of a complicated and and, and multi-layered question. Um, Yeah. So it, it's it's not legal for European wineries to ship direct in the U.S. Now, it doesn't mean they can't do it. It's relatively straightforward for them or for you to walk down to mailboxes, et cetera, in Genoa. Right. And, you know, send a box and call it olive oil and sort of have it show up here. Uh, and, it, it, and people will periodically do that when they're traveling over there. Um, if the wineries are, 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 are able to sell at the cellar door and, not all of them do more do now than used to, but certainly still not everybody does. Um, but the European wineries don't have historically have not had nearly as much of an orientation around commerce and marketing as we do here in the U S. And so it's very rare to find one that has, you know, a tasting room that's open to the public 
with a staff, you know, with a bunch of inventory that's available for sale and a staff that's working there that can help you ship at home. And even if you, they did have all of those things, there's no way for you to sort of buy the next thing from them, generally speaking. So six months from now, you want to buy some more. Almost, you know, it's very rare for wineries over there to have an online shop or to have any kind of integration into e-commerce and then fulfillment, um, again, because it's, it's, it's technically illegal for them to do that. So certain wineries will have pieces of that. But uh, it's very, very rare to find one that has sort of an integrated effort in that way. Now, what we do, what we spend a lot of time doing is in addition to managing all of the uh, logistics and compliance to, to deliver those goods in a way that makes it, it actually legal for the wineries to do it in sort of a scalable, robust, sustainable fashion, um, we also spend a lot of time just training them about how to think about how do you communicate with customers? What kinds of things do they expect you to, to uh, say to them? How frequently do you talk to them? What products should you offer? How do you price them? You know, sort of that whole um, direct to consumer approach to marketing in general is something that, again, it just, they don't think about it that way over there. And so we spent a lot of time with sort of general purpose consulting on ways that they should do that. And, you know, as part of that, things like, you know, how you would arrange a tasting room, should you have products for sale, how would you price them, and, and those sorts of things are, uh, are things that we, we, we help them with as well. But at the end of the day, for the customer in the U.S., you know, what you experience if you're um, visiting a VinConnect partner winery is the same thing you'd experience in Napa. So you visit the winery, the winery says, hey, if you've enjoyed what you tasted, give us your email and we'll put you on our mailing list. You go back to the U.S. three months from now, you get an email from the winery that says, hey, the new vintage of Barolo is available. Here are the wines for you to purchase. Uh, you fill out a form and send it off. And six weeks later, you get a box at your door with the wine delivered from Italy. And that's the stuff that, you know, where we sort of facilitate not only the transaction, but the logistics. Nice. How, how did you, so you, you're taking a step back though. You didn't really, this sounds really complex and like in the weeds, like you've been working in wine in a while and you took, you know, your knowledge from that and brought it to this, but you weren't in wine before you were in like finance. How did you, can you give us a little bit of that and like how much, I guess you just took your wine passion and made it into a business? Yeah, it's it, it sort of, yeah. You know, I, I spent about 20 years as an investment banker um, and, you know, made a sort of a good career of that and then kind of decided to make a life change that included a relocation from San Francisco to the East Coast in Virginia. Um, and in the process of that, I had been involved in a couple of different sort of wine related activities. Um, took some classes on commerce and wine. I negotiated over the course of about 18 months to try to buy a wine import services business. I uh, helped started sort of a newfangled retail wine concept with some friends here in Charlottesville. Um, and so even though I wasn't necessarily of the wine world in the way that a lot of people are, I certainly had some different sort of views into it. Um, and then combine that with, you know, being an, an active mailing list customer of, of wineries in Napa and stumbled on the idea of why this thing didn't exist for wineries in Europe. And then just decided to go try to figure that out for myself and, uh, and was able to, you know, over the course of about a year of, of research and work and conversations with attorneys and things like that, was able to sort of put the pieces together for turning this into an, an actual business and, and a uh, legally compliant effort. But it's amazing. I mean, in the, in the year since I've started VinConnect, um, I probably had 25 different people over the years tell me, man, you know, I thought about doing that and somebody should have done that a long time ago. And, you know, I, I just don't know, you know. It's, it's been waiting to happen. I don't know why no one ever figured that out before. So I don't know, maybe it was sort of an obvious thing and I just happened to be the guy to put the pieces together the right way. I'm not sure, but I'm glad we got here. So, What what percentage of the Europe, European wine market do you think is completely excluded from uh, folks who live domestically here in the U.S. to have wine shipped, just say, from some retailer in New York or California or somewhere? Are we only seeing maybe five or ten percent of the wines that might be available over there if they were widely distributed? Well, you know, I mean, I mean that's 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 an interesting question. There are sort of two pieces to that. So, 
So certainly that's an issue. I mean, I couldn't even tell you what percentage of, of the wines made in Europe actually get exported to the U.S. in terms of, yeah. you know, number of SKUs. I mean, it's it's single digit percentages, maybe. Sure. Now, the vast majority of the best wine made in Europe gets exported to the U.S. The U.S. is for most of our wineries. I mean, the U.S. is the single biggest market for wine in the world. Certainly the single biggest market for fine wine. Um, and most of the top wineries all throughout Europe, the U.S. is their single largest market. In some cases, maybe the domestic market in the U.S. is number two. So if you're making great wine and trying to charge a hundred or more dollars a bottle for it, you're selling, you, you know, you've, there's a pretty good chance you found a way to get into the U.S. market and tap into that here. Um, so at that end of the market, um, most of the best wine comes to the U.S. That being said, you know, your ability to access it, is, as you observed, is, you know, contingent on the vagaries of the U.S. alcohol distribution legal system, which is complicated as all get out. Um, and so many of the best wines aren't available all across the U.S. Uh, or are available in a limited fashion in certain places. Uh, you know, many of the kinds of collectible things that that our customers are interested in that are the kind of things that that you guys are putting investments together around. You know, the available quantities of those are very small. They're highly allocated and customers, uh, depending on where you live, you know, either have a hard time finding them or it's almost impossible. Um, and so, you know, the the um, mailing list vehicle and the ability to connect directly with uh, the wineries that produce some of those kinds of wines is an important way for people who are really passionate about certain specific brands, uh, whether that's to collect them or to have them every year on their anniversary or sort of whatever their reason is, um, you know, that having the access that is provided by uh the mailing list kind of relationship is 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 really increasingly important to American customers, and at the same time, you know, um, even the wineries in Europe that are making wines that are hugely in demand throughout the world, and specifically in the U.S., um, you know, sometimes they'll say to us, "Well, you know, why do I need a mailing list? I already sell all my stuff, you know, everything I make anyway." And our answer to that is, you know, you're you're a Burgundian wine producer, you make you know, one barrel of Mousinie every year and, you know, it sort of goes out to the wind, you know, do you want that to be consumed by, you know, the person in a restaurant who says, you know, bring me the most expensive bottle on the list, or do you want that wine to be consumed by someone who knows your wines intimately, who visits you every year, who's hugely passionate about the art that you create and who will really appreciate this special, you know, tiny quantity that you make. And, when you explain that, you know, sort of the light bulb often goes on and they go, okay, I get it. Yeah, that makes total sense. So it really is good for both the wineries and uh, and the consumers who are interested. Yeah. Yeah, it, make, it makes sense uh, to me how a producer over there would be really interested in working with you. I uh, want to hear about what's it like in the reverse? Would I come to you and say, you know, I visited France Last month, we went to a couple of producers that I had never heard of. How can I get wines consistently from them? Is that a type of uh, conversation that you often have with folks or is that not really how that relationship works? No, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, you know, we, okay. we have a roster of wineries with whom we work. And so if you want to buy Pago Chateauneuf to Pop, you, we would love it if mm -hmm. you would know that they have a mailing list and the mailing list is a great way to do that. Now, I that see. wine's also available in, in retail in the U.S. in yep. various places, again, to a, a, a greater or lesser degree. Um, but, uh, but you know, the best and easiest way to have that direct relationship with the winery and make sure you get access to things like uh, large formats, things like the special super high-end tiny production cuvées they make. They make a, a, a red called Cuvée de Capo and a white called Cuvée a Tempo that are, you know, a couple of barrels of each, um, you know, those kinds of items, you know, you'll almost never find those in retail in the U.S. Uh, but being on the mailing list, you get access to those kinds of things. And so the combination of convenience for the customer uh, in, in terms of, you know, the new vintage finds you, you don't have to go find it, uh, access to things you might not otherwise get. And then, you know, increasingly important is, is, is provenance, knowing that the wine is coming direct from the winery when you're paying 
you know, $800 a bottle for a 100-point magnum of Cuvée de Capo, it's nice to know that it's traveled, you know, in temperature-controlled conditions. It's come directly from the winery. It's going straight to your door, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, finding it at a retailer all the way across the country and kind of who knows how it got to the U.S. and and, and some of those, or how it's been treated and those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, it's just a matter of uh, specifically uh, individual wineries who offer this sort of mailing list service to their American consumers and, and, and we're the sort of vehicle for them to do that. So what we, if, if, if you are collecting and love the wines of a particular estate and they don't have a direct to consumer program, you know, the, the way to do it is to bother them to, uh, you know, make sure that they call VinConnect and set something up. So people like you can uh, get the access to the wines that you want. So going down the allocation model questions, um, is it the same type of thing if I want to get on the list for like a high end California place? Is like, do you have an enormous waiting list or like are certain producers, like if you're VIN connect, like VIP, like I've, I've always thought about this, like, can I just sign up and get access to the best stuff right away? Um, you can sign up for as many mailing lists as you want. Uh, and it doesn't cost anything. There's no obligation to buy anything. You know, we have 80 producers in total right now. Um, we don't have any wineries yet for whom, we have wait lists, but, you know, as you know, for certain California states, Harlan, Screaming Eagle, guys like that, you know, that they sell out 100% of their production direct to consumer every year. And they've got years and years and years worth of waiting lists of people lined up. Um, so we don't have situations like that yet. That being said, um, you know, this direct to consumer channel, you know, the U.S. is one market of the 50 different countries that our wineries sell in, for example maybe the biggest market, but still one market. Uh, and the direct to consumer channel is just one piece of their entire channel in the US. And so the total volume that goes direct to consumer is just a sort of a complementary piece of their global distribution efforts, as opposed to somebody like Harlan or Screaming Eagle, where it's kind of just about everything. Um, and so we do have situations, for example, the last couple of years in Burgundy, where, you know, uh, 2020 and 21 were, were years of very diminished production volumes due to hail and weather and mildew and things like that. Um, and for a couple of our winery partners, you know, they didn't, they weren't able to allocate any wine to the mailing list in the U.S. in those two vintages. With other partners, they were able to. Um, and, you know, the mailing list was about the only way you could find some of the uh, some of the wines of some of our partners in Burgundy because so little of it otherwise came to the U.S. or maybe it just went directly to restaurants and didn't even end up in retail. Um, so, you know, th that, uh, uh, you know, there is a, a, a big benefit in, in terms of access in a lot of cases, sort of just depending on the winery and the vintage and, and other factors. So... Hey. Your your focus in terms of like your regional focus of wineries, can you talk a little bit about that um, and sort of, I guess, the particular focus on Burgundy? Um, I also saw, you know, your relationship with Santo in Greece and uh, uh, Gooseborne and Ridgeview, it looks like, in, um, in England or the UK. Well, I guess they're both in England. Um, so, yeah, kind of some, uh, you know, the mainstream, we got a bunch of Burgundy producers, but then also a few in some... Uh, uh, emerging regions? Yeah, um, um, so we're pretty well represented across Europe's major growing regions. You know, for mm -hmm. us, unlike uh, an importer, you know, we don't think about having a, a, a book or some sort of mix of, of regions or wine varieties or those sorts of things. Uh, you know, we'll work with, with any winery that has a big following in the U.S. and a large demand of customers mm -hmm. who would want to be on the mailing list. Yeah. Um, and so the regions that you see represented for wineries that we work with um, are sort of what you would expect if you think about sort of collectible European wines. So Bordeaux and Burgundy, two big ones. Um, we work with a number of producers in Piemonte and in Tuscany is probably the two major Italian regions for sort of collectible wines. Um, but we also have a handful of wineries in Germany, as, as you noted, a couple of uh, sparkling uh, wine producers in England. We work with Chateau Moussard in Lebanon. Um, you know, we don't have any producers today in South Africa, for example, or New Zealand. Uh, but there isn't any reason why we couldn't or wouldn't. It's just a matter of 
uh, finding wineries that have sort of big enough brand presence and existing demand in the U.S. market where we know that there would be uh, interest in building a, a significant mailing list around those. When on that note, this the winery has come up multiple times on the podcast, um, especially by Bartholomew Broadbent, who said it was his favorite wine in the world. Chateau Musar, how did that become so well known? And yet, well, how did it become so well known? And yet, how how have other Lebanese wines, you know, I not not come, I guess, as close? Like, there's not even like a second, you know, we know DRC and then we know others. Like, how come we only know right. that one? Is it? Just Lebanon. It's a really good question, Billy. Um, you know, it, it, it starts with um, Musar making very uh, consistent and systematic marketing efforts in the U.S. going back probably 50 years. Uh, you know, they were the first, you know, to, to my knowledge, the first sort of notable uh, Lebanese wine sort of broadly sold in, in the U.S. market. Um, and the winery for, you know, the better part of 30 or 40 or 50 years was run by a very dynamic uh, uh, gentleman, Serge Hoshar, uh, Hoshar, who had a uh, just a tremendous personality. And, you know, the frequency with which he would come to the U.S. market and the relationships that he was able to build, both with, uh, you know, people in the channel, retailers, distributors, et cetera, as well as consumers when they would do consumer events. I mean, it really was the accumulated effort of 40 years of him coming to the U.S. and just pounding the pavement and shaking hands. And at the same time, of course, making fantastic wine. You can sort of do all the marketing you want, but if the product isn't very good, it doesn't help you a lot. Um, and and I think those factors really helped a lot. Um, you know, getting the support of some of the seminal wine reviewers of the time back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Michael Broadbent in the UK, Robert Parker in the US, you know, getting the wine in front of them and getting their sort of support and encouragement to both consumers and the trade that, hey, you should pay attention to this. It's, you know, it's it, it really is worth uh, uh, worth learning about and, and, and tasting. And then finally, I think the other contributing factor is, you know, those wines are made in a very distinctive style and flavor profile. And they, they not only um, taste different than things you taste other places, but they also are really singular. They just taste like themselves. And um, that distinctiveness, it's not necessarily for everybody, um, but they have a flavor that, uh, you know, blind tasting or whatever, you know, they're, even though the individual wines are very different characteristically, vintage to vintage, the variation is much broader than, than really almost any major fine winery I can think of. And yet they retain a distinctiveness that always tastes like Musar. And, and uh, because it's so distinctive um, and because so many people, uh, I think, sort of gravitate toward it, it's just been, you know, the kind of thing you taste it and it, it, it connects with your brain in a different way and it's very memorable. And for lots of people, they find it delicious. You know, the prices have continued to be pretty reasonable. Current vintages for them, you know, still are in the 60s uh, dollar per bottle, which, you know, relative to where the price points on things like Bordeaux and, and California wines have gone is still very accessible. Um, you know, they, they haven't made 10 different uh, single vineyard things and reserve wines and crazy double and triple price points. Um, they make a series of, of uh, lower end wines, but Chateau Moussard, Red, White and Rosé are the best thing they make. And, and those are the top of the line at, you know, kind of 60, 70 bucks. And, and uh, that allows them to appeal to a pretty broad swath of the customer base. Um, you know, why, why other people haven't been able to come behind that in terms of uh, Lebanese wines? I mean, certainly you see more things from the Middle East in the U.S. market now than you probably ever have. Um, as a result of, you know, some culture and, and sophisticated palates and things like that. But still, no one's really been able to get anywhere near Musar in terms of market visibility. But for folks who haven't tried them, I highly encourage you to seek them out. Like I said, the, the prices are very accessible and the wines are very distinctive and interesting. And they age forever. Um, they release late vintages, actually, periodically. They have a huge library, so you can find wines 
you know, in from the 2000s, 90s and 80s and stuff, you know, on uh, restaurant uh, wine lists and, and in retailers much more than you would from almost any other estate outside the U.S. And that's pretty cool as well. And not, not to linger too much on Musar, but do uh, what are some of the distinctive features of like the red wine? Uh, I see it's I guess their their flagship is a cab, a Carignan. Um, am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. They, what, what are some um, of the distinctive like tasting notes? Not to put you on so, the spot. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's um, so it's 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 a red blend of of generally Cab and Carignan, Morvedra, and then a handful of other things, including some indigenous varieties. Hmm. Uh, and so the the blend really is 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 pretty different than you'd find most anywhere else. I mean, you could argue maybe some folks in the Languedoc or Southern France are doing some sort of funky things like that. Yeah. Um, the second thing is they have a tendency to um, have a real uh, funkiness or barnyardiness or earthiness um, to varying degrees. And, um, you know, certain people's palates have a higher or lower sort of sensitivity to that. Some people find some of those flavors as appealing and adding to complexity. Other people on occasion find them a little bit off-putting. But nonetheless, there's a, a real uh, distinctiveness there that that um, you know really feels like they 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 came from a uh, from a place that you can identify. And then I think the last thing that's super interesting about them is, like I said, the vintage variation is quite sizable, both in terms of the blend that they use, as well as just how the wines evolve over time. Um, and so. You know, they, they all taste like Moussard, but, you know, some of them can go in the direction of, of uh, almost Burgundy or sort of Beaujolais. And other ones are like very powerful, ripe California style, you know, um, you know, rich, uh, uh, you know, fruity kinds of things. And so they, they're all unique and individual and different. And there's even some variation um within vintages. So, you know, one of the years ago, we did a release for them of uh, their whites, which are, are only made from indigenous varieties, which you'd never get anywhere else. Um, and I was shipping some bottles to a customer. I was in the warehouse and our boxes have uh, three bottles on each layer. And the three bottles from the same vintage that I was putting in the box were all three dramatically different colors of yellow. There was sort of light yellow, mm -hmm. medium yellow, and dark yellow. And so I emailed the proprietor and I said, you know, what, what uh, you know, geez, this is, this is, this is some, some variation here. Uh, you know, what, if, if customers ask us about why these are so different, what do you want me to tell them? And he said, all of our wines are living things. Each of them evolve at their own rate. And like, that's sort of what you get when you get Moussard. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> so it really is, cool. uh, you know, for them, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug for, for other kinds of wineries that might be viewed as a bug, but for them, it's definitely a feature. So I, I guess you're, you know, your average client looking for coming to you, signing up for the list, looking for wine is re, are re receptive to some of these things, or I guess, does it, when I say receptive to these things, like looking to explore, um, some producers that maybe they're not as familiar with, um, or I think, can I think you describe your average, average sign up? Person? Yeah, I think it's typically customers that are are, are are joining the winery mailing lists are, are doing yeah. it because, you know, they already know and are familiar with that particular winery. Okay. You know, they've, they've, they visited Cataluki di Sopra in Tuscany and had the wines and met the guy and Francesco was awesome. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, I'd want to be on their mailing list. Um, or, you know, they had the wine in a restaurant here in the U.S. and it was amazing. And they Googled, where do I buy Clos de Tarte? And, you know, an ad came up and said, hey, they have a mailing list, join the mailing list. So, so we are very much um, uh, connecting with or selling wine to people who've, you know, given us permission to, to email them and have specifically said what they want. Um, so... You know, anyone who'd sign up for the Musar list, you would think would have a pretty good understanding of what the wines are about or sort of what they're getting into in a sense. That being said, you know, a, a customer might come to VinConnect to sign up for Conaliki di Sopra, 
and then see the roster of other wineries with whom we work and go, oh, I've heard of this Musar thing. You know, somebody, you know, my buddy told me that's that's cool wine. You know, maybe I should sign up for that one too and check it out. Um, and so it's very easy for, you know, customers to, to get exposure to a variety of, of other wineries that they're curious about, again, with sort of no obligation or anything, and, you know, have the opportunity to every six months, get an email, learn about the wines that they make, learn about the vintages, learn more about the winery itself and decide for themselves whether, hey, you know, this new rosé that's being made by Elena Volk, uh, you know, I had that, you know, I was, they had that at the table next to me at the restaurant last week. You know, maybe I'll get some bottles of that. It sounds like it'd be really good. So, so it's predominantly people who are coming to buy the things that they know they want, but also have the opportunity to, to, to do some exploration beyond that with things they may have heard of, but may not be that familiar with. How have you found certain producers that you're working with? Do you have a Lena Volk in your, in your portfolio? Yeah. Indeed. Oh, wow. I was going to say, so like, have you found people like for her, for example, that you might've started and they were kind of, their wines were top notch, but they were in a different price tier. And then now over time, they've kind of, migrated up a bit because i remember studying for my certified exam and it like the recommend from psalms was like oh elena volk is like really high quality but like really affordable and now i go to buy her wines and they're like double what i think <laughs> you know <laughs> every winery has their own sort of evolution of of um their product set and their pricing strategy i guess i would say um and and, and so those things just kind of evolve over time um you know, we, we've had some producers who went from not being able to sell out other wines to now they sell everything out. And so now it's time to move the price up because, you know, supply is fixed and demand is growing kind of a thing. So it really, really, really depends. You know, I, I think having gone through a pretty significant inflationary period here in the last couple of years in terms of costs and things like glass bottles for wineries in Europe went up 50% two years ago and have not come down. Like it just, it's a step function. Like everything's just that much more expensive labor and those kinds of things. So, you know, there has been definitely some price inflation to, to greater and lesser degrees sort of across all of fine wine, I would say. That being said, you know, some wineries have been more aggressive than others in terms of doing things like creating new luxury cuvées for which they charge three times as much or, you know, making four single vineyard wines now that are double the price what the regular one would be and, and things like that. So there has, you know, many wines have very consciously gone down a path of sort of premiumization, if you want to call it that, finding ways to charge more for the things that they make. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, you would expect and, and they certainly deliver on, you know, making more distinguished and distinctive products that they're charging more for. But, you know, other times, um, yeah, you know, it can, it could be as simple as, geez, this thing I bought three vintages ago is now, you know, is now 75% up from what I paid for last time. And, you know, you, you definitely see that again, specifically in Burgundy over the last few years with the, the short crops in 20 and 21. I mean, you know, most people just felt like they're only making half of what they made before and they just had to charge a lot more for it. Um, now, like all, uh, industries, oftentimes, you know, prices go up and are stickier longer than, you know, the way they come back down on the other side. And so oftentimes as you go through these cycles, you know, the trend kind of goes in one direction, unfortunately, most of the time. Nice. Well, I think her wines deserve it. So I'm happy for her. It's not like she's just <laughs> upcharging, but, uh, that was just something interesting. Yeah. Were you going to yeah. say something, Brittany? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, you know, you had mentioned starting on a project in Charlottesville. What was that? Was uh, You said a retail project in Charlottesville. It wasn't crush pad, mm -hmm. was it? No, it was not. Although, although that's, that's owned and run by uh, a good friend of mine. Um, yeah, it's a great place. No, we started a, a little business here called the Wine Guild of Charlottesville about uh, okay. a dozen years ago, maybe even longer than that, which is a bit of a sort of a newfangled retail concept, sort of a club and a tasting room and, and things like that, which has gone through a couple of different ownership instantiations and is alive and well and doing great today. So what's your sort of like current relationship or perspective on the Virginia wine sphere? Well, Virginia wine is that's that's sort of a whole other topic. Um, you know, it's, it's <laughs> been incredible here. for me to uh, to to in the time that I've lived here. So going on 13 or 14 years now. Um, 
see the growth and, and, and evolution of the industry to, you know, there were maybe a hundred wineries, you know, bonded wineries in Virginia when I got here 15 years ago. And, you know, there are 350 today or some crazy number like that. Um, you know, the, the growth of the industry has been amazing. The increased professionalism, you know, as a result of investment and technology and, and things like that has, has definitely raised the, the level of quality, I think, uh, across the industry. Um, you know, that being said, you know, for my dollar, to be honest with you, I'd rather drink European stuff, um, you know, just sort of dollar for dollar, you know, so much of the production here in a place like Virginia, which I think is probably similar to some of these other sort of secondary U.S. markets like, you know, uh, New York State or Texas or places like that. You know, so much of the production gets sold locally to sort of tourists, um, not necessarily people from out of state, but, you know, going to the winery on a Saturday afternoon and sit around and drink a couple of bottles of things. And because of that desire from local people to support the local industry, which is fantastic, you know, the wineries can charge very attractive prices um, to satisfy that demand, um, you know, in, in a way that, you know, it's, it's, it's just different for, for things like imported wineries to compete with. And so, you know, for, for, for my 40 or $50 a bottle, uh, if I want to drink Cabernet Franc, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look to someplace in France more so than uh, Nelson County in Virginia, but, you know, I don't begrudge those that do. And I think they, they, uh, you know, increasingly do uh, a better and better job. So it's, it's, it's fun to see the progress. And of course I have lots of friends and relationships that are, that are in the business, uh, in, in various ways here. And it's, it's uh, fun to have gotten to see them evolve and grow as well over that time. Yeah. Go ahead, Billy. No, no, I was going to shift gears. You keep asking your Virginia wine question. No, no, I'm, <laughs> no I, I don't, don't want to get in a, any sort of spat with Kevin because I'm a, I'm a Virginia wine um, advocate. Well, you are too, but I mean, um, I would reach for, I would reach for the Virginia cab franc for the uh, European style. Uh, yeah, anyways, yeah, but well. one of the one of the other um, sort of relationships that you've built has been with Vint and with Nick early on uh, with the company. Can you just describe just briefly is that story of how you came to get to know Nick and I guess Billy back then at that time because Billy was pretty early on the team when we um, yeah when Vint started up back in 2019 2020 uh, that area. Yeah. Can you talk about that. Yeah, Nick and I got got introduced through a mutual uh, sort of relationship, um, and you know, so, so someone that that we both knew that said, "Hey, you guys are both doing wine things, and in Virginia, you should get together and chat." And uh, so it was my pleasure to to sit down with Nick and and kick around. And really, at, at, at that point, it was just sort of an idea in his head uh, for what what Vint might be. And we had a, you know, sort of a couple hour conversation about what his thoughts and plans were. And, um, you know, it, it was evident to me pretty quickly that that Nick had figured out something very interesting and, and an opportunity that could be very exciting. Uh, the background that he brought from the finance world, uh, obviously, I could appreciate given that I shared some of that background. And uh, I was really impressed with what he had figured out from a sort of the, the finance angle on what Vint does. Uh, but I, I thought he was uh, a little bit lacking in our first conversation on uh, his knowledge specifically about <laughs> wine and some of the vagaries and issues about investing in wine and um, uh, some of the history uh, of that and, and some of the inherent challenges. And, and so my uh, sort of challenge to him in, in uh, the wrap of our first conversation was was really to, to go and immerse himself in that so that he could build his knowledge of sort of the, the wine side of things uh, to match his knowledge of the finance side of things. And, and to his credit, you know, he went off for a few months and did that. And the next time we got together, he was able to present a much more sort of comprehensive and fully formed plan for what Vint would be. Um, and to be honest, you know, that's what Vint became initially and, you know, pretty much the same model that, that you guys have continued to execute so well on today. So it was really uh, fascinating to see him him uh, go through that and to see the fruition of that become 
uh, the, the business and in, in its uh, you know robust growth that, that you all have been able to demonstrate over the last few years. So it's been uh, it's been an exciting uh, ride to get to watch. Does your does your average uh, mailing list client think of their seller as partially an investment or not so much? At, you know, what, what's kind of your average client like in that sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, we have a couple of, of what I would call sort of cohorts of customers at VinConnect. So we have, you know, the person who went to a winery on their honeymoon in Tuscany and they want to be able to buy that wine every year and drink it on their anniversary. And that's the wine that they know and love. And they have a little spot of bottles that they keep to always have it around. And so that's more of a, a, a novice customer who's joined the mailing list to sort of focus on the one relationship they have or, or one or two relationships they have with the wineries they know. You know, th that, that person's not thinking of it as, as a collection. Sort of on the other end of VinConnect, um, we have another cohort of customers who are very, very, very savvy wine consumers who are sort of omnivorous. They drink wines from all over the world, the U.S. included. They uh, have a seller. They're collecting wines. Um, you know, they, they, they know the best wines from the various regions of the world, and those are the things they want to drink. Um, and, you know, those customers are on 10 or 20 or 50 or, you know, we have a handful of customers who are on all of our mailing lists just because they want to get, you know, an email, you know, every other day, excuse me, from one of our producers to see what the things are that are available. And, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, they're getting 10 emails a day from, you know, retailers around the country who are selling stuff and they are just in the flow of wine and wine collecting and, and cellaring and those sorts of things. And so that cohort, relatively small, a number relatively high in purchasing power are the kinds of people who are thinking of it as A, a collection, and then I think to a degree, B, as an investment. Um, and, you know, those things can kind of go hand in hand, uh, I think, for people who are interested in in buying and and, and drinking, you know, some of the finest wines made in the world. You know, that's one of the neat things about about this as something to be interested in is you get to, you know, appreciate it and drink it and then have the chance for it to appreciate in terms of a, a yeah. financial sense as well. Um, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and to yeah. that point, every, you know, every wine purchase is whether it's, you know, an $11 bottle or $1,100 bottle is an investment either in, you know, the appreciation of the asset or, a future investment in an experience at some point. And so, yeah, I, I, I like the way you kind of divide into those cohorts. And I think those are interesting how the, uh, that, that first cohort of folks who has a really intimate experience and then is able to keep coming back to that same producer and continue that relationship. I think that really demonstrates the, you know, kind of the effectiveness of Bing connect. That's really cool. That you can yeah, and, and to be clear, you know, we, we don't think of them as VinConnect customers. We think of them as the wineries customers. Oh, I see. Now, the customers have to transact through us, and, and we manage the fulfillment and the delivery and any customer service issues and, you know, UPS smash my box and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. But they're not buying because Kevin said it's good. They're not buying because I gave it a giant score or whatever. Or I uh, like Gary V do, you know, tasting videos and whatever. They're buying because... They love the wine. They met the winemaker. They drank it in a restaurant, whatever. VinConnect is really just sort of the conduit that that allows that to happen. Um, and so we we are are, are very um, focused on making sure that the wineries, brands, and relationships are what's at the forefront. And you know, we're just the, the folks here in the middle doing our job to make it happen. Cool. The the question I was going to ask a bit back. Um is more on the climate change side of things. Um, I'm just kind of curious to hear what you've been hearing since you've had these relationships directly with the producers. What, what have they been saying? Maybe pick a couple of regions to kind of give like general overviews or maybe even just producer by producer if you want. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think obviously that's a huge topic um, in wine and with good reason. I think that, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of change and evolution around climate. I think one thing that, that goes a little bit unappreciated um, is that it's not just 
temperature that is changing or temperature and weather that is changing, uh, the, the, the growing conditions in, 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 in which wine is increasingly being made. Um, it's also CO2 concentration. And, you know, whatever your opinion is on, on temperature changes and trends, um, there is no question that we have been going through a period of rapidly increasing CO2 concentration. I mean, it's basically a linear graph. And there have been studies, a number of studies done on the impact of increasing CO2 concentration on the, the fruit that's produced. Um, and if you just think as simplistically as CO2 is food for the vines and the grapes, um, part of what has, has, has driven, you know, increasingly earlier ripening and, um, and, you know, higher concentration and higher alcohol and those sorts of things. It's not just more sunlight. It's also the CO2 part of the equation. And, um, and so even if, you know, we were to go into a cycle where there's, you know, somewhat less, uh, you know, uh, temperature pressure, if you want to call it that, you know, I still think as long as China's being China, we can fill around and do all we want here in the U.S. with electric cars. And, you know, the CO2 concentration is going to go up until something happens with that. Um, and so so the, I think the, the trend is is ingrained, but almost more broad based than just thinking about it simplistically like temperature. So as a result, you know, wineries are doing things to respond to that. You know, we've got you know, growing seasons migrating uh, further and further north. We've got uh, wineries in different regions, um, uh, you know, thinking about or, or to a degree planting new grape varieties that are better suited to, to different temperatures and different ripening environments. Um, you know, I think the, the a fantastic thing that's been happening is, you know, through this period of evolution, wineries have more and more sort of tools and technology available to them today than they've ever had to, to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, and the sophistication and the knowledge base that is sort of shared throughout the industry around these topics um, has has really helped the wineries manage this uh, changing growing environment in, in a way that, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, just that just wouldn't even have been possible. Um, and so I think the the industry has been remarkably resilient to date to some of these changes. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to think that that's going to continue. Um, so I don't think, you know, it's going to be a desert in Burgundy every anytime soon. And that, you know, Scotland's going to be where we're growing Pinot Noir and, uh, and, and Chardonnay. Um, you know, but I, I do think it's, in, in my mind, it's sort of more positive than negative in that I think uh, uh, the environment, or the, the, the warming and the CO2 environment is, is opening up more land for grape cultivation um, than we've had, you know, just looking back over the last kind of 50 to 100 years. And with those opportunities increasing, you know, you're, you're, there's more and more terroir that can be discovered and developed and planted to grapes to, 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 to see what kinds of amazing things can be made. And, you know, you're seeing emergence of, of, of regions, you know, Swiss Pinot Noir didn't used to be a thing, at least sort of on the global stage. German Pinot Noir, you know, there's some people, Marcus Mahler and others making friggin' amazing wines that that 15 years ago used to, didn't even exist. Like you couldn't even find them. And so, you know, not that there aren't uh, challenges and threats to the industry and changes that we're going to go through, but as a consumer, like I, I think it's, it's it, as an exciting a time as it's ever been to to discover and seek out new things that the warming and increasing CO2 environment is 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 allowing and, and creating so i think there's as much creation as there is destruction or even more creation to be honest with you that makes sense i mean for somebody like me who loves just trying new things and i'm constantly drinking new things i'm right with you but i, I do wonder for folks who like a wine that has you know they've been drinking it for decades so there's a certain style and then that's starting to slightly change due to some of these changes have you heard that from anybody that like you work with or not work with but that buys from you that's like I like this, but it's different than it, it used to be or anybody complaining. Well, you know, to be, to be honest with you, I don't think it's as different as it used to be. I mean, uh, hmm. uh, you know, the, 
in many regions, you know, there was an evolution of style that was that was driven by, you know, sort of American palette preference and the prominence of American critics in the, you know, sort of late 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. Um, you know, we can talk about uh, Tuscan wines and Piemontese wines and, and even, you know, stylistic choices that were made in Bordeaux in terms of vinification, you know, where things got really ripe and really fruity and really over extracted. You know, and, and those stylistic uh, 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 choices, you know, have generally swung back to to much more, I think, sort of conservative winemaking approaches as a result. Um, and so, you know, we're not back to making, you know, sort of Bordeaux in the style of, uh, you know, the, the mid 70s, where we had a bunch of crappy vintages and cold weather and lots of rain. And so the wines were lean and things like that. But um, despite you know, increasing challenges in terms of climate, the style of those wines has, has become sort of much more, you know, rational and restrained and not necessarily reflective of higher temperatures and more CO2. And so it goes back to my point earlier about wineries having more tools and, and, and techniques and approaches available today than they've done before that has allowed them to make choices that help them manage some of those factors in ways that, that they just didn't have the resources to do before. I mean, one example is, is, you know, one of our producers in Tuscany, um, you know, eight or 10 years ago, the first time I visited them, they were doing uh, uh, basically they would harvest in the mornings and they would flash cool the grapes for about 12 to 24 hours before they would vinify them. And because they were in a particularly warm spot along the Tuscan coast, that was, you know, that, that was a choice that they made, um, that they really thought helped the wine show more restraint. And now, you know, I mean, I've probably heard half a dozen of our wineries talking about using that technique where it's appropriate for them to do so. So just, just things like that. I mean, that's just sort of one choice, um, that, that has allowed folks to manage better. And, you know, there are, you know, dozens of those kinds of things sort of at, at the, the, uh, in the toolbox of, of winemakers to, uh, to, to try to craft the kinds of wines that they think are really reflective of the vintage and the terroir and, and, and less, you know, just sort of hot and ripe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It makes sense that you talk about, I mean, I I'm with, I'm with both of you on there being more opportunities to explore new regions and new terroir. Um, I am sympathetic to the idea that wines, the wines that we've known, you know, just say, 30 or 40 years from now, the wines that we've known may become more monolithic and more singular in profile. Um, so I re resonate with maybe the Billy's concern, but I also he hear you, Kevin, that I don't think that's really happening and probably isn't going to happen for a while. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, well, that change. I mean, you know, we'll, so, we'll see. I mean, the one thing we're sure is it's going to continue to evolve, yeah. you know, things will change. So. And so as we maybe look to wrap up here, we're getting closer to our time. Um, what are some of the things that just, you as Kevin Sitters are enjoying these days that can be domestically here in the U S or, or, um, over in Europe. Um, just a couple of producers, a couple of things that are interesting to you and that you're drinking. Wow. I mean, I, I again, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty omnivorous as well. I, I, uh, I, I try to try to taste a, a lot of things and, and there are lots of, uh, areas to, to greater or lesser degrees that, that, that are capturing or that have captured my interest. So what comes to mind? You know, I'm, I'm drinking more whites these days than reds, curiously enough. Um, you know, trying to trying to go a little uh, lighter on my diet and on my uh, on my consumption. And so I find that I'm cycling through the white side of my cellar a lot faster than uh, than the reds these days, which is great because, you know, that, that, that the red stuff just gets to age even longer and will be even better when I get around to it. Um, Specifically in terms of regions, uh, you know, I, I, I drink, a, I was pretty early on the rosé bandwagon. Um, it's more of a, a flavor profile than a region, but um, I continue to drink a lot of rosé and it's been awesome to see over the last 10 or 15 years, more and more producers. Um, I mean, sort of everybody makes a rosé today, which isn't a great trend necessarily. But the thing that's exciting to me is more and more wineries are producing sort of gastronomic rosés you know, real high quality wines that happen to be made in the style of a rosé as opposed to, you know, sort of a throwaway thing so that there's a pink bottle on the table. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think there are just some fascinating, fascinating, super high quality rosé wines out there. Uh, Domaine de la Morteray is it makes uh, some of my favorites. Um, you know, Moussard makes a rosé that's super hard to find and get a hold of. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lopez de Heredia makes a, a, a rosé that's friggin' amazing. Um, you know, and some of these can run in the 60s and $70 a bottle kinds of things. But I mean, they're absolutely fascinating, super great with food, incredibly flexible, ageable. You know, I, I drink rosé with uh, Thanksgiving dinner every year, aged rosé. So that's that's uh, one of the things that's sort of always on my list. Um, so, so high quality rosés is one thing that I'm super excited about, you know, in terms of regions, you know, we've started in the last few years to work with a few people in uh, Alto Adige, so Northeastern Italy. Um, and, you know, that's a place that, again, I think it's sort of benefited from the, the warming and CO2 trends. The wines there have been able to get more ripe in, you know, the last couple of decades than they were able to in the you know, 70s and 80s, let's say. Uh, and so producers there like Elena Valk, like um, Ferrari makes sparkling wines up in that area, Alois Legator, um, uh, Cantina Terlano, you know, there are a number of producers up there that make uh, white wines, Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc, things like that, uh, Gewurztraminer, as well as sort of lighter body reds um, that are really interesting and super drinkable and very reasonable uh, to, to your point, Billy, from a, from a price point perspective. Um, so I find myself uh, spending a lot of time there. Um, what else? You know, I've been a big fan of Piemonte for a while now. And, and of course, there's a lot of interest in that region increasingly, both <clears throat> in terms of the everyday wines as well as things that are collectible. Um, and I know you guys have, have done a few things with wines from there. Um, an area that that is seeing an increasing sort of presence in the U.S. market that, again, I think has benefited a little bit from the warming trends is a region called Alto Piemonte, which is a little further north. Um, you know, there are a couple dozen villages up there uh, that, that, that produce wines um, that are generally based around the Nebbiolo grape, uh, but have a little bit more floral and higher acidity than, uh, than traditionally Barolo and Barbaresco might. Um, that again, having been able to get a little more ripe recently have made those wines, I think, more complex and more interesting. And, you know, they're sort of what Barolo was in the 70s and 80s now is sort of the flavor profile of Alto Piemonte. And, you know, price points there, again, are, are, are more reasonable than Barolo and Barbaresco. So things that are pretty accessible. So off the top of my head, those are some of the areas that uh, that I'm enjoying. And again, the last thing is I just reiterate something I, I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, like Swiss and German Pinot Noir. You know, there are some beautiful, just elegant, uh, really nuanced, really complex uh, kinds of wines coming out of those areas. They're, they're hard to find. And, and, you know, you can, you can run into, you know, it's sort of like Burgundy 40 years ago, you can run into ones that are really lightweight and not particularly interesting or expired, you know, inspiring and, you know, maybe have uh, regret for your 50 bucks, but man, when you find your way into some ones that are really interesting they can really blow you away. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on the, the rosé thing just for its, especially for its food friendliness and versatility, like you said. And it's one of those wines where you can get a great rosé for super cheap. And also they should probably be priced more for just that very fact, some of the quality of yeah. the and, the, and the versatility. Yeah. So Yeah, no, and, and, and you're seeing that again with, with some of the top producers, people who are making the gastronomic rosés. I mean, yep. they've really been sort of aggressive with pricing. And, and I think the wines hold up. You know, it, it's fascinating when you, when you compare rosé to champagne. In Champagne, the rosé wines are premium priced to the regular sparkling yes. wines. Yep. You know, and in, in the other regions, the rosé is sort of cheaper than the other ones. So, mm -hmm. so this notion that that rosé is, you know, can be even better than the regular thing you make is is demonstrated in Champagne, and and uh, and and I think borne out with you know with the producers who who really take it seriously in a way that are trying to make something that's right. really interesting and special. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing with us. We uh, are glad to have you as a friend, both in wine and business, and um, hopefully, hopefully able to shine some light on the access that you're bringing, especially to you know wines in Europe. And uh, so we really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing. 
No, it's a, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you guys having me. And and you know, if if folks are interested, they can go to vintconnect.com and and look at the producers with whom we work. Again, it's it's uh, free to sign up uh, to receive mailing lists from uh, the different wineries. The wineries are you know generally do a release a couple of times a year, so you won't be flooded with uh, with uh, spam or anything. And you know, for uh, folks that are your listeners that are you know interested in sort of collectible wines. Again, you know, several of our producers make those kinds of things and being on the mailing list is a great way to get access to the kinds of things you might have trouble finding other places. And so we're, we're happy to make those available to folks and, and hope folks take advantage of it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. We'll talk to you soon. And, um, yeah, thanks for your time. All right. I really appreciate it guys. Cheers. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yep. All right, that was our interview with Kevin Sitters. I hope everybody enjoyed his interesting takes on where the wine world is, his different producers. Um, and yeah, I think he had an interesting perspective on on how climate change is also impacting the wines. I didn't think about CO2 emissions as much as he had brought it up. So that was really cool. Um, also now go check out, it'll be on the Vint website in the next week or so, and we'll link in the blog uh, the tasting notes section for the Vint podcast. Um, and we'll make that a little bit more prominent moving forward. And yeah, we'll be back with another interview and podcast next week. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circulars amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.